question. You know, social media is not good for many things. It's just not. I mean, we're maybe somebody's watching on Facebook. Glad you're there. Don't spend too much time uh, after the service. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, social media is, is sometimes a good thing, right? Sometimes a good thing. Like, for instance, every single person in this room can identify with the joy of a certain baby that went viral this past week as she had this baby, Blakely. She had her first taste of ice cream. And I will just, before I play it, I will tell you, watch the eyes. Okay, so, little Blakely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the dad's trying to get it away, but notice the claws. And he says, I, she says, I'm not letting go. And I ask, because uh, Hannah Shelton turned 12 weeks old yesterday. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and I, I said, it reminded me of, of baby Hannah when I saw that. Um, and so I've, I can identify with that joy. But uh, a couple other things that hit me this past week. Um, and uh, the first one was about some of the funny dynamics of human relationships, right? Um, and I, I noticed an, an agape wife posted this this week. And I won't tell you who it is, but, uh, but, but Justin Jackson was in the crosshairs. And, um, but I immediately, I immediately uh, responded because I think my wife feels this way too. Um, oh, 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 that's not yet. Okay. Uh, married life, telling your husband the same sentence 10 days in a row just to have him say, you definitely never told me that. <laughs> my wife's nodding heartily there. Um, wives, it's amazing how often the man in your life forgets what you've said, right? Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Justin, maybe it's just you and me, brother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, men are forgetful. And, uh, but, but this one also was funny. Uh, guard. Execution is in three hours. What do you want for your last meal? Woman. I don't know. What do you want? Right? <laughs> it's amazing how indecisive... Sometimes women can be about food and where they want to eat, and the moment you say, oh, well, let's do this. No, I don't want that. You know, it's like, well, gosh. So here's, you know, here's the point of the funny, is that being confused in the context of a relationship is sometimes funny, but oftentimes very frustrating. And I want to ask you this morning, how clear... How clear do you think God wants you to be about his will for your life? I, I, because let's face it, as we come to this point today, you may be feeling all of the fuel of corporate worship has brought you to this point, and yet there's something in your life that you're asking, fervently asking God the question of what do you want from me or what do you want in this situation or why, why is this happening this way? And you just feel like he's not being clear, right? I mean, you just feel like he's not speaking and you're wondering, well, God, I thought you wanted me to have clarity. And I, I want to tell you this morning that God does want you to have clarity, but can I tell you, sometimes we run ahead of God and we want clarity about things that he's not ready to give us clarity about. He's given us clarity about the, exactly what we need to know in the moment that we need to know it. You might be asking for, you know, you, tell, you say you're asking for God to reveal the next step, but what you're really asking is for God to reveal the next four or five steps, and God says, I don't work that way, because you're not ready to see what's coming. Uh, you know, if God had told me last year that I would be here and we would be experiencing the presence of God together in this way, I would have said, That's, nah, I, don't know, I just don't see it happening. But then God decides to blow our minds sometimes, right? And that's a good thing. But He didn't just send us here, right? And just all of a sudden, we, it was conversations and hours and, and prayers and tears and steps and all these little steps that we thought were just you know one big step, one big step, one big step. But God was preparing the whole way. And so I guess my point in saying that is, is this relationship that you have with God don't think that God is intentionally withholding critical information from you. You need to recognize that God is speaking clearly. You've just got to listen for what He's really saying and be receptive to whatever 
he's saying. And that's really why we've been doing this, these seven I am uh, sayings, is because Jesus is what we're after. We're after understanding more about his character, more about who he is, so that we can find endurance and we can find affection and we can, we can find us worshiping in the midst of pain. So these seven I am sayings are basically Jesus appropriating the divine name of God, that I am name of God from the Old Testament, and adding a metaphor to paint a picture of his sufficiency for us. That's what he's, that, that's what he's doing. And so we saw a few weeks ago, he says, I am the bread of life. That means Jesus is the source of, of sustaining satisfaction, the only source of sustaining satisfaction. But then we also saw last week that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. That, it, that is, that he reveals the path of life for us to walk on. And so when we, when we think about Jesus being, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, and this morning I am the door, what we want to recognize is that, is that Jesus is revealing something about the kind of life that he has come to give us and how he gives it to us. Jesus, in, in all of these, but especially today, Jesus is, re- is revealing something about the kind of life that he has come to give us and how he intends to give us that. So we're picking up in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. But the problem is, is that this is a prime example of how you need to recognize the chapter divisions in your Bible are not inspired. Because you have a, 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 big, a big letter, I mean a big number 10, and you have a subheading. Maybe it says, I am the good shepherd there, because this week and next week's I am statements are, are connected but some, you know, somehow when we see that space there between the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10, we think, well, time's passed, different conversations, you know, and, and, and they just missed it on this one. This, this should be, you know, chapter 9, verse 42. Um, John ch- chapter 10, verse 1 should be. So remember that, because, because what's happened in John chapter 9 is that Jesus has encountered the man that was born blind, Y'all remember that? That was one of the signs, uh, Jesus healing the man born blind, and, and I think it was even one of the seven witnesses to this man being born blind. And, and basically, uh, interestingly, there were three messianic miracles from the Old Testament, and one of them was healing a man who'd been blind since birth. And so that's why you see throughout the remainder of chapter 9, after Jesus uh, uh, mirroring the creation narrative in Genesis chapter 2. He spits on the ground, he creates clay, he puts it on the man's eyes and then tells him to walk to the pool of Siloam. And so he goes, and as he's going, I think it was just this amazing, of course amazing miracle that whether he was born without eyes or his eyes were deficient in some way, that, that just as God created man from dust, now the Son of God is putting clay on this man's eyes, and it is, being, it is, it is causing these eyes to regenerate, to grow again. And when this man gets to the pool and washes off, he has sight. And the Pharisees come and ask him, they, they, they recognize him, and they get in this long conversation with him about what's happened. And he says, hey, I, I, guess, I, I guess John Newton quoted him in the hymn Amazing Grace, listen, all I know is I once was blind, but now I see. Right? And Jesus encounters him again and points him uh, towards salvation but something awful happens at the end of chapter 9 that we really didn't deal with last time that we, we need to recognize because it sets up chapter 10. That something awful is that he's gone back to the Pharisees and they've rejected him. Verse 16, Jesus has once again provoked the Pharisees by, by um, healing this man on the Sabbath. And look at verse 16. He said, some of, the, some of the Pharisees said, this is chapter 9, it said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? So basically, they were thro- lumping him in this category that because he had done the work of God and healed on the Sabbath, that of course he wasn't from God, he must have been a sinner, and there was division among them. And so the Pharisees rejected him. Well, they went to his parents, look at verse 20 of chapter 9. Uh, how then does he see? His parents said in verse 20, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but, now, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And his parents said that these things because they feared 
the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And that's exactly what they do. Look at verse 33. The man says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's the man who had been healed. But there's verse 34. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. You see, Jesus sees all of this play out. And he wants to confront the Pharisees for being false teachers, for being wolves in sheep's clothing. But Jesus is a good teacher. And so he doesn't just assault them with these personal accusations, but instead he uses a word picture that would help people understand about the Pharisees' influence and why they should be avoided. And he uses this word picture, and it would be one that would be very familiar to the people there in Jesus' day, but not so familiar to us. And so this week and next week, we're going to develop our understanding about this word picture so that we can mine the riches out of the depths of this passage. And it all, it all begins uh, today when Jesus says that he is the door for the sheep. He is the door for the sheep. Now let's look at verse 1 of chapter 10. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. And so Jesus immediately begins this word picture that involves sheep, shepherds, a sheep pen or a fold, it'll be called uh, a little bit later on, and then thieves and robbers. And he's going to develop out this, understand, this, uh, this word picture. But we've got to understand something about shepherding because I know some, you know, we've got a couple of farmers in here, but none of you have she- sheep. Do you all have sheep? Anybody? Okay, I don't see anybody with sheep. So we've got to spend some time talking about sheep. All right, I want to introduce you to Shrek the sheep. Anybody? Michelle helped me with my sermon, plan- sermon prep yesterday. You didn't know it though. Um, this is Shrek the sheep. He was found uh, in New Zealand. Typically, uh, typically, a sheep's wool would be at about 10 to 15 pounds of weight to the sheep when it needs to be shorn. Shrek had over 60 pounds of wool because he had hidden out in some cave because what we're going to find out about sheep is that they're very dumb. And, um, and so he was hiding out in a cave by himself, amazing that he survived, But he was found and had over 60 pounds of wool uh, that was on him. Now, sheep, as you can tell, they are very high maintenance. They're not smart. They they, they, They require a lot of attention. And so this was Shrek after he was, uh, after he was shorn, and, uh, and now apparently he has a website, and of course that's what we do these days, I don't know why. Uh, that is not what God's calling any of us to, to, to do in here. Um, but, um, but each day, shepherds would, would have their flock, and they would go out, and they would take them to a field to graze, a pasture to graze. And they had to take them to different places to graze because sheep are so dumb that they will just pull the grass out of the ground and eat the entire blade of grass and even just take it down to the dirt and they'll leave a a, a place totally barren. So shepherds would have to take them. And as you know by Luke 15, the parable of the the one that was lost, right? Kind of like Shrek. They'll wander off. The the shepherd has to make sure they stay together. Uh, But then... At the end of the day, they would come back to the village and they would, they would go into this sheep pen, which was, uh, this is uh, one from the Middle East now, it's kind of these stone uh, walls with uh, things that, that, so that predators can't jump over or it would hurt if a, a human being tried to jump over, but high enough where the sheep can't get out. And as the shepherds would bring the sheep back in from, the, uh, from, the, from grazing that day, they would bring them in one at a time. They would put their rod down and they would check that one sheep out. They, they would have names for their sheep, you know, fluffy or wooly or stupid. I, I don't know what they would call them. Maybe, I hope not. I hope not. That's, that would be mean. Um, but, uh, but they would have names for the sheep 
and they would check them. And, some, you know, Mike Rowe would have loved this because this was a very dirty job most of the time because as their wool, uh, you know, grew and as they had uh, a lot of lanolin in their skin and that was that secreted by the glands in their skin, uh, they would get, let's just put it this way, clogged up so that the shepherd would have to inspect and kind of open the wool up in certain places so they could see or other things, you know. And so it was not a glamorous job at all. That's actually why it was so amazing that Jesus appeared to shepherds and that they became these evangelists at Jesus's, I mean, the the angels appeared to shepherds at Jesus's birth because shepherds would have been the last people that anybody would have wanted to be around. They stunk. I mean, even to this day, I think shepherds still really, I mean, imagine spending your entire day just kind of hanging out, you know, and uh, with, with the smelly, you know, flock of animals. It just, it, 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 it requires a lot of attention. But they would do it. They, this profession was still very popular in Jesus' day. But going back to this, going back to this sheepfold, uh, you, you see something's missing, Right? It doesn't have a gate. And so, as the shepherd would bring his sheep in for the night, one of the shepherds would place himself right there at the entryway. And what does that, what does that, what does that mean? That means that any of the sheep, if they were trying to get out, had to go through him. And any predator who would be trying to come in would have to go through him too. In fact, it was when the sheep pens are a lot bigger than this, uh, the thieves and robbers would often, um, they'd jump over the wall, and I know this is graphic, but they would slit the throat of the sheep, and then they would toss it back over the wall because they knew the sheep would never go with them. A, the shepherd, they wouldn't go over the shepherd who was using himself as the door, but also, above and beyond that, even though sheep are very dumb, the one thing that they do know is the voice of their shepherd. In fact, when you would have a large sheep pen and you would have lots of shepherds coming in and bringing their, their flocks in, the next morning when they would go to the sheep pen, they would stand at the sheep pen and they'd have their own unique call. And they would call out to their sheep. And even though sheep are dumb, the sheep would know the voice of the shepherd and the sheep that were not that shepherds, they'd stay in place. And the rest of the sheep that were that, shep- that shepherds, they would go out and follow him into the pastures. And we're going to develop this more next week as Jesus actually says, I am the good shepherd, but that's not what he says this week. He says what? I'm the door. So there's something else that Jesus wants us to see before he gets in and advances that metaphor about the shepherd. But what we do know is that the sheep... That, would, that were following the shepherd, they wouldn't follow anybody else because they were going to follow that one shepherd who knew them well, who cared for them, who developed this relationship with them. And so, look at verse 2. It says, But he who enters the door, by the door, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. That's like the gatekeeper would be like a hired hand. If, if maybe the shepherds are really tired, they would come and have that hired hand to, to, to be that, that one at the door. But it says in verse 3, the sheep hear his voice, that is the, the shepherd, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, verse 4, when he has brought all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And then verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus just drives home this point that Sheep know the voice of their shepherd. And that's exactly what verse 6 is about. Look at verse 6. Imagine the Pharisees hearing this, knowing about shepherding, knowing about shepherds, but it says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Like they got the picture, the word picture, but they didn't get the meaning. And so that's what we need to dig out first. The people don't understand, so let's recap what we've learned about sheep so that we can dig out the meaning. First of all, sheep can't live without a shepherd. Pretty plain from the from the study we've done so far. Secondly, shepherds love and care for their sheep, even when it's nasty. And then thirdly, 
the only people who don't come through the gate are thieves and predators and robbers who want to steal or kill or destroy the sheep. Okay? And so let's figure out who's who in this word picture. Obviously, Jesus is the door of the sheep. He's the door to safety. He's the door to protection. He's the door to salvation. And then obviously also, the Pharisees and religious teachers, religious leaders, are the false teachers who don't care for the sheep. They're the ones who who jump over the wall. But then what about the sheep? Well, we've already established the sheep are human beings, but specifically, because of what had just happened in John 9, the sheep who are in this sheepfold are the people group known as the Israelites, the Hebrews. Because later on, Jesus is going to say, I have other sheep who are not in this fold. What's he talking about? He's talking about all of us, the Gentiles. But in this context, he says, I'm the shepherd of the sheep of Israel who are in the pen. And what's the shepherd doing? He's calling them out of this false Judaism that the Pharisees and the religious teachers have been teaching, and he's calling them to follow him to greener pastures. You see that? Jesus is the way out of this false religion and into this relationship with himself, with the the good shepherd, as he's going to call himself. But Jesus, seeing that they don't understand, look at verse 7. Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. So so if you want to think about this, one pastor gave this really helpful way of breaking down this passage. Verses 1 through 6 are about what Jesus is doing. Jesus is gathering a flock. He's gathering a flock of people for himself from the Jewish fold. In verses 7 through 10, he's explaining why he's gathering this flock. And then ultimately, what he is gathering the flock for is going to be found in verse 10. So Jesus is the door of the sheep. He's the one who calls the sheep by name. He's the one who cares for their needs. He's the one whose voice they need to listen to in order to find safety and green pasture. The one who sacrifices his own body as the door to safety and protection and salvation. He is the only door by which people can find life. Jews and Gentiles are alike. Now most people, based on everything that we just said, would be okay with Jesus. They'd be okay with the thought of Jesus being a really good teacher and being caring and loving and protecting. But the moment that you say that Jesus is the only door to find salvation, that's when people back up and say, now that is just you narrow-minded Christians being bigoted and thinking that you're enlightened more than the people around you. And if you've never encountered this, this argument, the, what I want to do is I want to prepare you for some of, the, some of the responses that I've gotten over the years as I've talked to people who are atheist or agnostic. Atheists are people who say that there's no God. It's actually an intellectually dishonest position because they're acting like they know everything. Agnostics are the more honest ones who say, hey, maybe God exists. I just don't know. I don't have that gnosis, that knowledge. I'm agnostic, right? Um, and so atheists and agnostics, what they say is, like Richard Dawkins, for instance, uh, instance Richard Dawkins says that it's, it, you know, religion's fine. It's the monotheistic religions that claim that they have the only way to God. They're the ones who cause the problems, and they're the ones who need to be eradicated. Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, uh, Christopher Hitchens, a number of these guys, uh, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you want to call them, like they are the ones who advance this narrative. And a lot of people root this back in the Crusades. They back this. They root this in what happened to Iran in the in the 1970s when they were taken over by uh, a, in a, a harsh Islamic re- regime. But most atheists that you'll encounter will will if they're ever trying to make an argument that hey, all religions are really the same. That's that's what that's what you need to realize, you you Christians. All religions are basically the same. You all talk about God. You try to make people good people, teach them virtue and all that kind of stuff. In fact, they use an illustration like this. They'll say, well, you know, there's some blind men 
and uh, they encountered an elephant. This is actually an old Hindu proverb. And, uh, and they, these blind men encountered the elephant. And uh, this one right here, uh, that's, uh, that's right here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. The, that guy right there, you know, he's like, man, this is a big wall, right? It's a big wall. And then this guy right here, who's grabbing the, the leg, he's like, no, man, this is a tree. Man, feel this. This, is, this. this thing's huge. And then this guy right here, or this guy right here, either one, says, no, man, this is a big snake, right? And they'll say, listen, all of them are wrong because they only see in part. They're only, they're, their perception is what's driving their theology. And they'll say, so, you know, Muslims and Christians worship the same God, you know, and, and uh, you know, Muslims and Christians and Jews, they worship the same God. Everybody just needs to kind of stay in their own religious lane, that's one argument that they use. Another one that they'll use is something like this. Well, you know, hey, listen, God's, yeah, we're all striving for God. It's just your path took you this way. This is a softer confrontation, right? You know, you're, you're on your journey, and it's your path. You know, you're taking path A over there. But hey, you know, this, is, this, would, be the, uh, this would be the God of Alcoholics Anonymous, the God of your own understanding, you're just on a different path. You just go on your path. You find God on your own terms. And it's encased in that kind of journey language. But there's flaws with both of these that are severe flaws. Let's go back to the elephant. What's the, what's the severe flaw about that? Well, Christianity is not based on somebody's speculation about what God is like and who He is. Christianity is based on the revelation of God Himself. Like God has spoken to us. So it's like in that, in, that, in that illustration, it's like if the elephant's like, hey guys, I'm not, I'm not a wall, a snake, or a tree trunk. I'm an elephant, right? That's what, that's what Christianity is. Christianity is speaking into the human desire for knowledge and saying, I want you to have clarity. Remember we started with that. I want you to have clarity about who I am. And so you have the Old Testament, God making himself clear, and you have the New Testament, Jesus coming and making God even clearer, See, that's why this metaphor falls short. It's not based on any one person's speculation. This is based on the revelation of God Himself as revealed in Scripture. But then the, the second one, all religions can't be different paths to the same God because not all, the, all religions say the same thing about God. A person says, well, you know, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Really? Have you read the Quran? Because that's not, that's not the God of the Bible. You say, well, well Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, their cults are kind of offshoots of Christianity, so surely they, they worship the same God. No, what you say about God and what you believe about God determines whether or not you believe God has spoken for himself or you're just making stuff up about it. Because Charles Hayes Russell for the Watchtower Society and Joseph Smith for the, for the, the Mormons, they both said, we have new revelation. You always need to be careful about that, right? And so these two illustrations fall short. And Jesus himself stands before the Pharisees. He stands in the pages of his, of his word. And in that way, he stands before us even this morning and saying, it doesn't matter if you believe this right here, I am the door. And friends, there was, there was one door for the ark. There's one door for the tabernacle, one door for the Holy of Holies, and there is one door into God's family. And this is why I love this. I love God's providence. Um, I'm going to be doing a, uh, 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 a college event in a few weeks down at the church that I was trained at. Um, Mandy and I are going down there to do the co- It's like a college disciple now. And Max is going to actually speak to you on John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. I am the door and John 14, 6 are essentially saying the same thing, but you're going to hear it from, from these two different perspectives. And I think, I think it's, he's going to do a lot better job than I could. But you're going to get to hear that from him in a few weeks, and it's going to be saying a lot of the same things. And this could not be any more relevant for us today. Because we're trying to soften things, we're making more palatable, and and you know, we want people to like us, and you know, if they if they if if we if we share truth and it's exclusive and we and we 
you know, we offend people, then hey, they're, they're, listen, if somebody believes, I mean, if my own children believe what's wrong, then I'm going to love them, but I'm not going to be afraid to share with them that they're wrong. Now, there's a difference between that and going and beating somebody on the head, and every time you say, well, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're right, and just become, be, being like a broken record. Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 13. You're like a clanging gong or resounding cymbal that no one wants to listen to. That's the purpose of that metaphor. But if you love somebody well, and you'll speak the truth to them and let them know where you stand, and then you continue to love them, and you wait for the brokenness to come into their life from the sin that has entangled them, and you're there for them, then guess who they're going to come to? The person that's loved them. Listen, people are wrong about a lot of things. We're wrong about, about, about some things that we, we want to continually be examining our beliefs about God while we're studying Scripture. But remember, God first loved us. And just like Brian said so well, He came to us as I created you. I love you and I want you to be with me. Right? That's Jesus. I created you. I love you. I want you to be with me. That I am the door. It's like Jesus saying, and Jesus is saying, I'm the provision for eternal life. When you come to me, I'm going to take care of you. When you follow my voice, I'm going to give you salvation and satisfaction and security. And look at John chapter 10, verse 10. One of these often quoted verses. The thief comes to only only to steal and kill and destroy. Who's the thief in the immediate context? It's not Satan. It's false teachers. It's the it's the people who say one thing about God and you go back to scripture and you're like, I don't really see that there. It's the people who are on TV saying, you know, if all 200,000 of you would give $300 a month, then I'll be able to buy my jet. Right? It, it's, it's, the, it's the people that hold their Bibles up. Sadly, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am, which all sounds great and good. But if you say that to start your message, and then you just kind of throw it away for the rest of the message and talk from your own opinion, that, that doesn't work. If I ever get that way, like bring tomatoes or tell Kevin Walker or the Deacons, like take me out. Like I, I don't need to be here if that's the case. You, we need to be like the people in Nehemiah chapter, chapter 8 that said, bring us the book. <laughs> bring, bring the book. The moment we stop saying that, it's the moment we get on a slippery slope. Jesus is the door. He's the only door. A lot of people are saying God evolves. United Church of Christ, who is a liberal denomination in the United States, their famous tagline says, don't ever put a period where God has put a comma. God's still speaking. I agree that God's speaking through His Spirit, but He's not going to inspire more revelation through you. And He's not going to evolve on issues that He's already been very clear about. It it, it doesn't happen. I'm going to give you a hint. I told told Max, we're going to add an eighth I am statement because John who wrote the Gospel of John, also wrote the book of Revelation. And guess what Jesus says in the book of of the Revelation? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he's the door in John chapter 10, guess what he is on January 26th, 2020? He's the door. He's the door for you. He's the door for me. He's the door by which you find salvation. But friends, John chapter 10, verse 10 says, he's also the door by which you find overflowing, abundant, over-the-top life. That's what that word means. So it's not just like, okay, I was, you know, I was young, I got saved, and now whatever I want to do. No, he's the door we walk through every single day that we wake up. If you want life, go to the door. Walk through the door, which means go to the book and open the book and hear about who he is and what he has for you. God never changes. Many of you grew up with this show, The Guiding Light. Remember that show? I, my wife and I, we've been in the past big Survivor fans, and, and I, I remember thinking, Man, how, that show's been on for like a thousand years, it feels like. And then I, I looked it up, the longest running TV show in U.S. history, Guiding Light. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, The Guiding Light was the longest-running drama of all time. It came on the air January 25th, 1937, five days after Franklin, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's second inauguration as, 
as 15-minute little episodes. It then lasted some 18,000 episodes and 72 years, finally ending on September 18th, 2009. You see, the series was originally created by somebody named Erna Phillips, who based it on her own personal spiritual experiences of having given birth to a stillborn baby and finding comfort in listening to sermons on the radio. These sermons provided the nucleus upon which the show was based. The guiding light actually refers to Psalm 119.105, reflecting on a minister saying that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so the minister would turn on this lamp and would, would, would turn it on to read his Bible and help the residents find what they needed. But with such an extensive history that the show reflected, in a sense, as time changed, so did the series. Over the years, the preacher was removed, the Christian message was dissipated, and the inspirational themes involved in, evolved into typical soap explo- exploitations and glorifications of sin. Even the definite article, the, was removed to where it was known when it finished just as guiding light. And the light went from being exclusively Jesus as the singular Savior to being just a guiding light among many. But make no mistake, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's God's will. I mean, that's that's His will for some of you this week. Just like Jesus looked at Peter and said, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. There are some of you in here being sifted. And I'm telling you, if you want to find the door to endurance, the door to steadfastness, the door to faithfulness, the door to, to, to a supernatural ability to cling to the Lord, you need to walk in fellowship and intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said, many people come to Jesus because of their hurts. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're hurting and you recognize that you need a life change. But Jesus won't heal your hurts until, until He can save you from your sin. Because your sin's what's killing you. It's beyond hurting you. It's killing you. Let's be honest. It's killing you. And so what will you cling to? Will you cling to Jesus? Or will you cling to what's killing you? Will you cling to the one giving you abundant life? Offering you abundant life? Or will you say, no, I'm, I think this is better. And cling to that. I want to tell you today, Jesus is the door. And the good news is, is that when Jesus died on the cross, that door swung open. So now that anyone who would put their trust in him can be saved, can walk through that door. And I have no doubt that that's some of you today. You you may have come to this church for, for a while now, and you've been afraid to walk down these aisles and to say, you know what, that's me. I'm hurting. I'm broken. I recognize it's my sin that's broken me. Today needs to be the day that you do that. Because the Bible says, today if you've heard His voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. And so today that needs to be the case for some of you. For others of you, you've experienced this incredible worship service and you've seen John 10, 10 maybe in a new light and you recognize that Jesus has been that good shepherd that we'll continue to talk about next week. You recognize His watch care over your life, but maybe you've, you've kind of tried to soften some of the things that you believe about Him. Can I tell you there's no life there? There's no life there. Embrace what Jesus has said about himself. Don't believe me. Open the book. And let it determine how you walk, what you believe, and where you go and what you do. And you will find that path being illuminated by the light of the world as you walk the path of life because you're following Jesus. He is the door for us. But one last, one last way of application and it has to do with our, our little jar where we're raising our Ebenezer in 2020. Carl Henry said the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. There are people around you you've known for a long time. But you don't know their spiritual condition. And we saw, y'all heard me say this past Wednesday, Mandy And that side of her family had three deaths in one day. Three deaths in one day. 
Got, got news this morning that one of our dear old church members from there from Abbeville is in hospice care now. That could be you this week. I, I don't mean to be morbid and, we, morbid, and we've lived through it, and so I don't say this lightly. And, and Lord, may it not be, but if it's your will. Guys, my funeral could be three days from now. You realize that? James chapter 4, we are a mist. You're not promised tomorrow. And so if there's anything keeping you from obeying Jesus, from believing in Him, from putting your faith in Him, if there's anything that's keeping you clinging to your sin instead of walking through the door of life, then today I'm telling you, throw it off and find freedom, find life in a relationship with the one who loves you and died for you. Let's pray together.